Hello and welcome to Josie and the podcast. This is Josie and I have a special episode for you today. This podcast features leaders who share everything from their latest tweet to their leadership philosophy. My goal is to connect tech and leadership with heart, soul, and lots of substance. Josie and the podcast is proudly sponsored by Campus Sonar, which means we've got to talk about social listening. You can stay on the pulse of the latest in social listening in higher education with Campus Sonar's Brain Waves newsletter. Campus Sonar is a higher ed social listening agency on a mission to help campuses find online conversations that give higher ed professionals the insights they need to support their institution's goals. And with their newsletter, you'll get insights on current events from founder and CEO Liz Gross also a previous guest on this very podcast. You'll get access to questions and answers from the Campus Sonar team of experts and awareness of what the team is paying attention to. I know it's not common to say that you can actually love getting emails, but y'all, this one from Campus Sonar is a gem. Subscribe today at info.campusonar.com backslash subscribe. All right, now I can share why today's episode is so special. Usually I bring you one featured guest or you get to hear me gab to myself in shorty episodes. But today we have a panel of four digital leaders. They joined me for a leading online series I launched during the quote unquote earlier days of COVID-19. You're going to hear from Myra Oliveros Uruerta, the Vice President of Student Support Services at Tarrant County College, Mordecai Brownlee, Vice President of Student Success at St. Philip's College, Mary Jo Gonzalez, Vice President of Student Affairs at Washington State University, and Tim Miller, Vice President for Student Affairs at James Madison University. The theme of our conversation is about the power of digital storytelling to educate, empower, and especially build empathy with students, staff, families, and more. They also spoke candidly about racial injustices as this recording took place in the very first week of June, a week after the killing of George Floyd. Each of these leaders is showing up and communicating their values in videos, blogs, Twitter threads, and so on. And while Months have passed since our conversation. They continue to share their values beyond a single meaningful message. All these vice presidents in student affairs are willing to situate their personhood into their position and are therefore helping redefine the role of leadership in digital spaces. They're transforming into core communicators for their campus, voices to be trusted in times of crisis as well as in times of celebration. One topic of conversation that was repeatedly addressed focused on the difference between being performative online and taking real action, even when it's not public. So I want you to think as you take in this episode, when you think about your own online presence and purpose, are you jumping on a trending movement or topic or actually sharing causes that matter to you most and you're backing it up with action. Take a beat to think about when you reshare. That quick reshare to Instagram story sure is easy or that Twitter retweet. But how are you, again, backing it up with action and consistently? In the months that followed this panel discussion, I've continued to watch these leaders bring to life the practices to be discussed on their social media platforms. Myra has advocated for mental health and is keeping up with her blog, Mommies on the Move. Mordecai emphasizes lives over politics and making decisions for our students 
as he continues to show up in video form. And Tim is still going live on Tuesday nights with his students as a facilitator and not necessarily always the face of some of these digital messages. And Mary Jo asks on Twitter, for example, encouraging us to think and talk about race and then how that makes us feel. And a quick note as you listen in, as all technology does these days, well, we always know it's not perfect and there's going to be hiccups. So about halfway through the recording, you're going to notice some internet issues and I, well, disappear. Thank you to Tim for graciously keeping the conversation going until I was able to rejoin the meeting, which was completely then through my iPhone. Note to self, you can join Zoom recordings through your iPhone. (laughs) So apologies for any audio hiccups, which just shows to show technology issues are kind of part of our life and we're all kind of rolling with it doesn't need to be perfect and that is what it takes to lead online but again this conversation was so important I thought to share even months ago and technology hiccups aside you can follow all of us on all the socials all those are listed in the show notes find the podcast on twitter Josie AT podcast and I'm at Josie Alquist Remember, everything we talk about from resources, people, and posts can be found on my website, josiealquist.com backslash the podcast. So let's dig into our campus leaders as digital storytellers panel. Enjoy. So welcome to the leading online series featuring campus leaders who even before COVID-19 have embraced social media and a variety of other digital communication tools to make a very real impact. This week, you're going to learn from a panel of vice presidents for student affairs who are actively engaged in digital spaces, using storytelling to communicate, connect, and transform what it means to be a leader in higher education. My name is Josie Alquist, and since 2013, I've been researching, publishing, and speaking about digital engagement and leadership in higher ed. A major through line of my research is the impact of how higher ed leaders are integrating social media intentionally, which comes down to values and vulnerability. This includes stepping forward to tell our stories, using platforms to influence and lift up others. And in no other time do we need this action from campus leaders to call out injustices such as ongoing racism. Um, So at this time, I am excited to introduce each of our panelists. Um, I'll give a little bit of background to them, and then we'll get going in our conversation. So let's start with Mordecai Brownlee. He's coming to us as the Vice President for Student Affairs or Student Success at St. Philip's College in San Antonio, Texas. He has led St. Philip's College to record enrollment and three consecutive years of record student in completion in degrees and certificates. Previously, Mordecai served as the Dean of Students and Chief Student Affairs Officer at the University of Charleston, and you can Find him on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. So he is everywhere. Hello, Mordecai. Thanks for joining us. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for having me, Josie. Next up, Mary Jo Gonzalez. As a low-income, first-generation college student, Latina, single mother, Mary Jo has dedicated her life to leading efforts with energy and enthusiasm, which help individuals achieve their academic, personal, and professional goals. She oversees 22 departments at the Pullman campus. Um, she also leads the university campus culture and climate initiative to create a more inclusive and welcoming community at Washington State University campuses statewide. You can find her on Twitter and LinkedIn. Welcome, Mary Jo. Hey, everybody. Looking forward to having a conversation today. All right. Next, Myra Alvarez Huerta serves as the Vice President for Student Development Services at Tarrant County College's Northeastern Campus in Texas. Her work as an educational administrator is framed by awareness of community culture wealth, funds of knowledge, and critical race theories. 
She works to create an environment in which students feel safe, cared for, and at opportunity rather than at risk. You can find this VP on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and also blogging. So great to have you. Thank you so much for having me. And last is Dr. Tim Miller, who is the Vice President for Student Affairs at James Madison University. His doctorate research, interestingly, at the George Washington University focused on decision-making of university presidents. Tim is also an active musician where he leads a band of faculty and staff members known as Staff Infection. We can talk about that as a form of storytelling. Tim is found on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Okay, so again, an impressive group and um, heart-centered leaders as well as we think about using our platforms to tell stories, amplify voices, and um, uh, and more. So as a warm-up, before we get to some more, um, more deeper reflections, is you are all on a variety of different platforms. I'm curious right now, um, what platform do you find yourself gravitating to the most in either public or maybe more private methods, like through direct message um, or other digital communication ways that has helped your leadership as a vice president at this time. And whoever unmutes himself first wins the prize of going first. All right, I think we're all being nice. So I'll go ahead and unmute first. There we go. So, um, you know, thank you again, Josie, uh, for having us. And uh, to all of my colleagues on the call, thank you for everybody joining us. So I would say that, you know, Instagram, for me, has continued to be a great um, tool for interacting with, uh, with with our first time in college students. So, so Instagram has continued to be very responsive, uh, direct messaging. I mean, certainly that's something from a setting standpoint that colleagues, if they're considered considering doing that using that tool, that they need to make the adjustments, especially if they don't already have a connection with that individual, uh, but to make themselves available through through uh, Instagram. Facebook, actually, I don't know if it's a resurgence due to COVID-19, but I have received a lot of messages through Facebook uh, assisting students and being of service to them and their parents, as well as high school counselors as well. Had a little bit interactions on Twitter, uh, but I, I don't know. Facebook has really made a resurgence here just more recently. I've also heard that message often, um, both in public communication platforms, but direct messaging. Thank you. Uh, I'll just add on to that. I think uh, I've often said that Instagram is where I connect with students. Uh, Twitter is where I connect with uh, alumni and Facebook is where I connect with parents. Uh, that's sort of been how things have played out. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, I've recently started getting, I think I've probably had 150 um, in, uh, requests on Facebook from students to be friends on my personal Facebook account. Uh, and a year ago, I would have said no, but actually in um, Josie's group that she runs uh, to talk about this, one of our colleagues sort of challenged that and said, you know, he just says yes to everybody. So I've now said yes to everybody. So I've been having a lot more student interaction on Facebook, really, probably in the last six months now that I think about it, where they have found me there. And it came from some of the message I put out around COVID-19. Uh, so a lot more student interaction on there and a lot more students asking to be my friends. Uh, so I'm doing that now. I've sort of now blended my business page and my personal Facebook page together in many ways. And that's a great designation. Tim has a, uh, like I said, a business page that you can like, and then his own profile, which a lot of times we call those personal pages. And you're also very active within different um, Facebook groups, um, like you had shared with the Connected Exec, but more for your campus, um, like your parent groups that you've been jumping in off and on. Great. Thank you. So I think I would say, Josie, you know, I'm, all of my profiles are public. So I have one page that represents Mary Jo Gonzalez since I opened it. And I think what I've found, what I've been finding lately is alumni are also connecting with me there, wanting to know what's happening with the university, where's the space. And so we have a pretty vibrant community um, on Facebook, but I would also say I've done more work I've always been the one who's send private messages or direct messages. I am doing more and more of that work now. And partly it's because students are reaching out, parents are reaching out. They don't wanna post information publicly about what they're experiencing. And so I'm hearing a lot of those stories in 
pretty big detail and it's helping me connect those students, um, staff, even faculty who are saying, I don't know what to do with this particular situation. How do I navigate it? So I think that's been really valuable is having that back channel that I think people don't understand. It's, it truly is like a text message and that is how everyone is seeing it. So I'm enjoying the communication that's happening there. Um, although it doesn't mean I'm always posting, it means I'm pretty active. People just don't see that side of the work that we do. Absolutely. That's a theme that's come out in a lot of these panels is what's not being seen in front of the screen. But I've also heard a lot of um, executives very concerned about the concept of going into a DM or direct message or messenger. And so I hope we're hearing it over and over that it is really a a solid tool um, to tap into. Thank you. Myra. And I'll be quick. I mean, I, I we have... Um kind of a different stance um, at, at TCC that's we're a little bit more controlled and that communication and all the different media platforms, social media platforms. Um, but I would say for me, LinkedIn continues to be, I think where I get more access to students. So students will connect with me on LinkedIn, which is an interesting double-edged sword because and now I have, we started this blog, uh, Dr. Taryn Ozuna Allen and I started this blog and I'm just like pouring my entire heart out there. But a lot of what I share in my communication with students um, has particularly been on LinkedIn. So I haven't gone out yet to um, let everybody into my Facebook um, yet, but I'll need, I just got added to the groups. So I need to go back and look at all the different chats y'all have had about doing that. Fantastic. Thank you for giving a little bit of context of that. I think it's it's really nice and some questions that are coming from the chat to kind of assess. And at the end of the day, it really is a personal choice, but to kind of explore into new waters, I think is important um, for us to explore what, again, what I'm kind of finding all in my research, but in these panels is we're kind of redefining and it's been needing to be redefined leadership and higher ed and student affairs of what's professional or what's not and what's just needed. Considering that, as we think about um, this next question, so the the core concept for this panel originally was about digital storytelling. All of you are showing up in lots of different ways from doing videos to blogs um, to th Twitter threads and so on. Um, it's You're communicating your values in almost a longer form type of way. Some of those values that we um, believe in and stand behind are speaking out against racism, hate, and injustices. And we can see now, especially as um, the days have gone on, more and more leaders and cabinets and universities are putting out public messages that are speaking out of these injustices, the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Amon Aubrey, and many others. Beyond public announcements, though, those are important. What do you plan to do? Or even if we were to think what we hope will come as we see the immediate and long term of these messages, um, not just one time posts on websites or social media platforms. OK, I'll jump back in there, uh, Josie, and I'll say that digital engagement, uh, social media, in my personal opinion, has made the world much smaller. Um, I think that. I would say 10 years ago, 10 years ago, it's very possible that um, the momentum that has been created, and I'm just using this as an example due to its relevance and, and the matter just occurring with George Floyd, Brother George Floyd, that we wouldn't have had this kind of momentum worldwide, certainly not nationally, if it was not for digital social media engagement. Just use this as an example. So as we talk about the universities and our colleges, public entities that have now come out and made statements against violence, made statements against injustice. It is quite possible as we look historically, some of these entities may not have released a statement in such a manner unless that that momentum was created within the core of that institution. You know, if something happened at that college, if students began to rise at that college, perhaps we would not have seen the kind of proactive responses that we've seen from presidents and administration. So I think that social media has played a big role in making the world smaller and creating more momentum uh, throughout our nation, throughout the world that students and colleges and universities can relate to and need to respond uh, very quickly to. Yeah, I agree 100%. I think there's institutions um, and I've seen even just in recent events 
we don't speak up about every event. I think the the critical mass of of events that have it's not like it hasn't been happening, but that we have seen um, in broad daylight, if you will. Now, I think um, have prompted voices to come out and and um, speak against this violence and and just racism in general in ways that we hadn't before. I'm an alum of the University of Oklahoma, have seen my fair share of racist um, incidents. And um, I think, you know, even following the movements of students and the way the students have been pressing for um, our institutions to be held accountable is great. But as far as like what I'm gonna do, the things that I put on my blog, go find my blog, I posted it yesterday. We have to call stuff out. It's uncomfortable, but you have to do it. Um, and listen to the Brene Brown podcast from today because she tells you and there's a really great analogy about how we are, we don't realize like the fish, right? You don't realize you're in the racism and, and a racist like adding to that um, until someone hands you an umbrella, right? And tells you, shows you how to protect yourself from the racist rain that we are all drenched in. So um, yeah, just calling it out myself and speaking up and going out on faith and hoping that it doesn't, well, just praying and doing good work. That's it. Yeah. And I would add, um, this is where the caution around storytelling is, is that it can't be performative. And I think that has been a lot of, um, colleagues and friends who put, for example, the blackout Tuesday and have never, ever posted, uh, even the words Black Lives Matter whatsoever. I We put Black Lives Matter in our campus announcement and people were shocked. And I'm like, but Black lives do matter. And if we're not going to state it pretty publicly and be there with our students in this, and by the way, shouldn't be my voice that's being amplified. It shouldn't be my feelings that are being amplified. This is not the time for me to come out with what I am feeling about it. It is, this is what our Black and African-American faculty, staff, students, communities, alumni have been experiencing for years. And it's frankly disheartening that it took nine minutes of a video for us to recognize that this is a problem that is historical. And so I want to add a piece to this, though. Um, one of the things that I have really tried to do and push our institution for is I posted on um, MLK Day a video that Martin Luther King had just called out the land and grant structure. And so blacks were pushing for land and property. The state government, federal government just gave away hundreds of acres, by the way, that had been stolen from our native brothers and sisters, right? And it really spurred a conversation. And so to me, if you're going to do this work and you're going to post those things, it has to be a part of every day of your life. And it can't be just when these things happen. We have to live it and walk it and talk it. And so I just need to say that as a, as a that's my caution is it's really easy to step into the be in the performative because you feel good and you want to erase that guilt that you have because you're occupying a place of privilege. Mary Jo, I appreciate you saying that. I think that, you know, as, as a white person of considerable privilege, I've really struggled with figuring out what to say or not say and what spaces to step into and at uh, what point am I taking space from others? And, you know, it's been an interesting week for me, week or so for me. I was actually on vacation last week. I'll put that in quotes on vacation last week because it wasn't, but uh, I was at the beach. But, um, and I go back to one of the things Mordecai said, I didn't turn on the TV for all the whole week and I knew everything that was going on in the world. Uh, and I didn't need the TV to know that. And it has become small. And I think that, I think we have to think about as we're telling a story, are you telling the story to get credit for the story you're telling? Or are you telling the story because it's true for you and it's authentic to you? Are you telling the story and are you taking someone else's story? I just, I, I, I've honestly struggled with figuring that out. And, um, you know, I had a really hard conversation on Monday with my multicultural center staff because we, we didn't tell our story the best we could have. Uh, our letter wasn't, it wasn't what they had hoped it should be. And I think we missed the mark in some of it. And, uh, that was hard because I pushed for the letter, uh, and, but and it's hard when you try your best and you still have some people that feel like you missed it. Um, and and then it's interesting because then you have other people who say, "Why did you even say anything?" 
Uh, so I, and I, you know, it's a very interesting world to live in the, the pull of that two different sides of, uh, it's not, not two sides, it's like 400 sides. Um, so anyway, I, I think it's interesting that um, we used to have a policy of, we don't comment unless it's within our community or directly a part of our community. And I really appreciate consistency with things like dry cleaning and, you know, you know, my, getting more oil changed. I'm not sure that consistency is the most important value I need when we're dealing with the lives of college students and and recognizing um, their needs and how to advocate for them and serve them. The 400 side analogy is quite the visual of the layers, complexities um, that one panel discussion cannot even hold, nor one public announcement. And again, I just appreciate all of you holding space to even process out loud with me as we as individuals and our own identities are doing that unpacking with our families as well as within our positions and sharing um, even examples of how maybe missteps, what can be learned through those as we as we move forward. So at this point, I'd like to, um, well, I called them hot seats before, but they're also showcases of each of the work that you're doing. And um, it's aligned both with things that you shared this last week that I think are important to give as examples. Again, there's no one way to do this thing called digital leadership or enacting your platforms for the intent to make an impact but there, there's examples that you can um, learn from and be inspired from, especially now. So Myra, let's start with you. I found you through LinkedIn. You are, you've always been very, very active there. Um, and so it's fun to be able to feature you just showing up on when, you, when we were on campus at events, doing uh, articles, and then also creating your blog that you shared with us um, a little earlier. You shared a couple pieces pieces recently, one piece called No Really, I'm Okay and Other COVID-19 Lies I Tell Myself, and some really telling, um, you could call it authentic, vulnerable, uh, revealing reflections in there about how you're processing. And then this latest um, with your co-author, you wrote Racism and Old Pandemic in a New Year and that you both penned together. So a couple different questions to maybe get to know your use of social um, and choices, um, especially with LinkedIn and blogging. Tell us what, what has happened because of your activity on LinkedIn consistently? And then why are writing these pieces that even aren't on a university website or just blogging period, why that's so important for a campus leader to be doing and almost outwardly processing? Well, thank you. Um, And I appreciate the questions because they make me process what I do in a different way. Um, So LinkedIn, because just like some professional panels, I've participated in, I was going to say performed, they feel like performances, right? It, LinkedIn can be such a, you know, I only want to show you the good things in case you want to hire me or in case you want to work with me. These are the very, very uh, curated things I want you to see. And part of my reason for choosing LinkedIn is because I think it's where I have my widest professional network. Um, and I'm very intentional in wanting to kind of pull back the curtain on what it means to be a Latina, a mother, a spouse, working in leadership, because so many of us um, that don't necessarily have to fit into those identities just don't think these are jobs that are for us, because it's not what we've seen. So here's the ugly of it, or the pretty of it. Um, And and here's what you get when you get with me, right? Like, this is what you're going to Um, experience, um, what what it's rendered as far as like outcomes from doing all this here. Certainly a lot of connections with younger professionals and um, even, you know, there's some chancellors in there and some presidents in there. Um, So it's been really interesting to see the network that I've been able to create, partly because also in conferences, I make sure to connect with folks um, and, and not just to speak, to be heard and to be seen, but to be intentional in the things that I say. So at work and everywhere else, I'll be the one to ask about our undocumented students and what we're doing for them and how we're, you know, populations that, again, are, are seldom um, are American Indian, Native American populations. So, but again, I've been intentional about doing it on LinkedIn because I want to help 
other women, other mothers, um, or other minoritized people see that these are spaces for us that I cry and I, you know, have anxiety and all these other things happen, but you get through it and, and it actually humanizes you to your students and to your colleagues. We're not these sticks just trying to do all this stuff. We, there's a lot of heart and that's what I want to show. I really appreciate that um, visual and a couple of the quotes from your blogs. The COVID working from home stress is real. Grant yourself grace. This is hard. That's um, just allowing people to be in agreement that this is hard. And then from your most recent post about um, racism and old pandemic in a new year, as you had shared about revealing about your anxiety, um, but even how you have cried, revealing some of those pieces calls folks in um, to see themselves in you. So. Thank you. Sure. Mordecai, you have been a long time video producer in a variety of different platforms. Um, These short videos, leadership and education, um, they can be found LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. They have ranged in topics that are timely um, from digital literacy, self-care and more. And they're definitely an audience to educators. Um, You even address in tweets about like, signaling to educators to read. Why is it important for a vice president to even put in that time to do those types of video creation and digital spaces? And what have you learned maybe from from putting your voice out there to do that? Yeah. So Josie, I I think that, and and I think that everyone that's on this call would say that the reason why they're doing what they're doing is because they feel called to do this work, right? So this is not, you know, there's other ways to spend your time, life, and make sacrifices, but, but being an educator um, is, is, in my opinion, one of the, the, the most important uh, sacrifices that one can make. I mean, and so it's our responsibility to advance society. It's our responsibility to advance our communities, to create this idea of active citizenship and, and, and productivity and to, you know, help to, to remove poverty and the mindset of poverty, as well as the practices of poverty within, within the various communities. And so it's with that idea in mind that, you know, my, my sole focus has been when it comes to a lot of these projects that I've had uh, been blessed to participate in is to encourage fellow educators because each and every one of us on the front lines in different communities in different ways, serving different student populations. And we're also, because of our platforms are coming in touch with people that others may not, right? In different in different venues. And, and as an educator, folks have a sense of vulnerability in the classroom or in these learning settings because they're seeking knowledge, right? They may wrestle with the knowledge, but they're seeking something. And that's the reason why they're there. So then I think that's even more impactful behind the responsibility that we have to the students in the communities that we serve to advance those uh, those communities, even within its prejudices, if you will, in an array of ways, right? And so going back to what uh, Dr. Myra was even mentioning is, is that we, we have the ability to make a strong impact across the board. So that's why it's been my focus to, to um, have those engagements and uh, encourage fellow educators. I think we might have lost our fearless leader. <laughs> you know, Josie, when you get back, let us know. You know, by the way, this is the awesome part of managing in this world as a part of digital storytelling. It's okay when we screw up and it's okay when things go bad. And that's right. It's, that's right. it's a part of the world that we live in now um, when everything is so virtual and so digital. Zoom at its finest. Absolutely. Zoom awesome. at its finest. <laughs> right. And I think Josie was back and then is gone again. Oh, Josie, are you back again? Yeah, you oh. keep freezing. It's all good. We, hey, Josie, if you need us to, we can step in. We're all vice presidents. We know how to manage the call. That's it. You, That's it. We'll take over the program. <laughs> can you at least hear me? Because I can mute my yes. screen. Now yes. I can hear you. Now we got you. <laughs> okay. Oh, my lordy. I apologize. This is the first time this has happened. I was even hardwired in. You know, you just can't. You just don't know. Okay, so let me uh, let me bring that back to Mordecai. Uh, at least there were some good giggles in there. I did hear them. I appreciate that. You were laughing with me. I know. So, Mordecai, we were chatting behind the scenes a little bit about how you purposely paused your production to really ground yourself to move forward and thinking about the content that you'd be putting out um, going forward, thinking about like the killings of George Floyd um, that really 
is important to think about that moment of pause and purpose. But what has that decision taught you about why slowing down about what we do post and produce is important for campus leaders? Yeah, Josie. So I would say that it's so important for those that are, are watching this. Um, there needs to be a strong sense of intentionality uh, behind what we put out to the world, what we put out to our students. My, my mother who um, there's parts of my family that, that there's African-Americans and then based on our family history, there's also some Native Americans in there. And so I bring this up because there was, a, there was this concept that was taught to us as children called scattered feathers. And the whole concept was, is that you never necessarily know based on that particular situation that you're facing. Uh, it's so important to, to put your best foot forward because the chances of being able to recall and undo what have been the wrongs that have, you, you never may get that momentum back, those people back, those interactions back. So it's so important that there's a strong sense of intentionality, not just in how you conduct yourself in social media, but how you live your life. And so it, perhaps that concept helps someone today, but I think that that's the importance behind intentionality and every, and also in every student that we touch, right? You never know what that young man, that young woman, that, that person is dealing with, and so you can be that that ray of, of uh, sunshine for them. And uh, it's just so important. That's our work as, uh, as educators. So uh, Mary Jo, how about I uh, do your introduction? So Mary Jo, from my observation of you and online, you truly embody the spirit of Washington State. So to no surprise, you posted a video on Facebook called Fight Song Friday and cheered the school song. You also wrote in the post how you challenged other campus leadership like the Dean of Students, athletic coaches, and even the President and First Lady many of whom were also active online. So how has your expression of hashtag go Cougs spirit called your community together online? So um, many of you may not know this, but I had a life-threatening illness um, in the fall and um, it took me out of work for four months and that was complete homebound. I couldn't go anywhere. I was at risk every day of survival. And I had just started to emerge from the this cocoon of safety in December and January and so I was I had and I'm by the way I am can you tell I like Coog gear um oh, I forgot to add my Disney uh Coog ears right um I love Cougar country and I have always had this idea that we need to support the campus that we're in. So when I was in North Dakota, I was the Blue Hawk. When I was in at Iowa State, I was the Cyclone. And at University of Rhode Island, I was supporting Rhodey Rams. And so I combined, as I was coming out of this cocoon and really recovering from um, this major illness, I realized that I had not sang the fight song in about eight months. <laughs> and for me, that's like not breathing. And so what I chose to do is um, post a video about Fight Song Friday and about, and I talked about how hard COVID it was and about how difficult it was to be away from everybody and that I just needed a pick me up and I was going to use the fight song to sing it. And so I did challenge uh, a lot of folks and I put it in our alumni and alumni were singing it as well. And so people started posting video. The one that I was so proud of though, was the fact that our AS, our um, access center, which manages the support for our students with disabilities, um, they did the fight song in ASL. And that went more viral than mine, which I was really excited about because then people started posting the fight song in ASL. And so we really approached it from, we're going to support all of our Cougs, no matter where they are. Um, and we're going to definitely meet them from a universal design perspective. And so that's kind of the perspective that I took about what does it mean to be a part of our Cougar community? And really also because I had just recovered from this major illness, I could identify with students being homebound because I got homebound again um, and will be homebound for quite some time compared to my colleagues and our students. So that's really thinking through what that looks like and feels like and their experience, which was pretty difficult at the time. And, you know, I, I have, unfortunately, or fortunately, I have very active president, vice presidents, ADs, athletic director, uh, regents who are active on social media. And so we've been, we, this is what you all may know, we do coordinate behind the scenes about who's going to post what, about um, what information should come from the WSU Pullman point point of view or the WSU system, which as I'm the system vice president, which 
one needs to come from Mary Jo, which needs to come from the vice president of finance and admin or our vice president of marketing communication or our dean of students. Um, and so having those background conversations and I didn't tell anybody I was challenging them to fight song Friday. Um, they just got it because uh, I wasn't planning on coordinating. It just went on its own in its own way. Well, and Mary Jo, I appreciate you sharing the, the personal aspect of this. Uh, and how that sort of came about for you. And I think it's interesting maybe for all of us is so many times when we do this, we're planting seeds that we have no idea if they're going to grow. Like you had no idea that ASL thing was going to come up and it did and made such an impact. And, and I wonder how many more students felt welcomed in your space and, you know, at your university because they saw that and how that sort of meant things to students in so many different ways than anything you had intended. Exactly. Exactly. And our alumni were just as on board. And so they were starting to practice it. In fact, some of the videos came up and they weren't getting it right because even the, the mountains, right? Uh, I, I get that where I could put three instead of two. I spell, we spell out our letters. So W-A-S-H-I-N-G, you, know, you know the letters. Um, and I'm talking to someone who's wearing purple, by the way. So that's like my, um, our tribal school, University of Washington. So I'm chuckling that he's asking me the questions in purple. Um, but it is, that's what the crimson and gray, it's who we are. So I was really excited to be able to talk about that from a branding perspective. Because this school is an alum, that's the other part. I'm an alum of WSU. So it makes a huge I was able to support all of the other campuses I've been at, but now, now I'm able to talk like real life about what these two degrees that I got here, the kind of impact that it ha happened on my life and my daughter's life. So those are some pretty cool things. Yeah. And I, uh, I'm an alum, two-time alum at my current institution too. So I, I understand that there's something about being home. No offense to the other institutions where I work, but there is something about being home. Josie, I just sort of kept us moving. I hope that's okay. <laughs> Oh, Lord, I am on my phone right now. Our internet has completely gone out. Um, so thank you. <laughs> so do you want me to finish up Mary Jo's and hand it back to you? Or sure, that don't sounds know where we great. Are? That sounds so, great. Mary Jo, as you saw, uh, you know, the, on Twitter, you shared an article, maintaining mm -hmm. professionalism in the age of black death is dot, 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 a lot. And you added the note um, that it's not just your, but your, but our. Uh, remaining a quote from the article to read. And do you want to read the quote since you're the one who put it out here? Sure. Um, so it's a great article on what um, Black employees are experiencing. And it in the article itself, it said your. And I really thought about it. And Mordecai, this goes to your intentionality comment that you made earlier, is that it really isn't your employees. I had to go, no, this is our employees. And so what I wrote was not your, as in someone out there, it is our Black employees are exhausted. Our Black employees are scared. Our black employees are crying in between meetings. Our black employees have mentally checked out. Our black employees are putting on a performance. And I thought it was really important to not make it about me and not make it about the learning for me, but to own that and to accept my responsibility in that. And I did some things afterwards that frankly, I'm not gonna talk about publicly because that's the part of the public performative. I don't need to be patting myself on the back. I've done this in other spaces when things happened. Um, I do what I need to do. And I think that's the other piece of this um, work is that not just around equity and inclusion, but frankly, who I am and ownership of my experience and knowing um, that I have contributed and I'm complicit, even as a you know, non-Black POC, I own some of this, especially at the vice presidential chair. And if I'm not signaling this and I'm not saying it, um, I am absolutely not being the person who I aspire to be. So we've talked a lot, you know, I talk, I've raised my daughter since I was a young, uh, when she, she was very young as a single mom. I said, you know, every time you point the finger at somebody else, three of those fingers are coming right back at you. And so having to go, okay, this is happening out there. And it meant that I also needed to talk to our cabinet and have a conversation with my president and say, you know, we've said some really important things. Today is not the day we're going to do that again we're going to say what we have to say. It is racism that is the problem. It is COVID-19 has laid bare a lot of the inequities that have existed. Now people are just becoming aware of it, but we have to own that and to own even what our own WSU police, how we are complicit in that too. And so part of that is for me, the process of navigating that um, as a leader. And again, a lot of that has to happen behind the scenes, but for me, it was important for us to own that it's not somebody else's employees, it's my employees that are feeling that way too. 
I am so thankful this conversation has been able to continue. My fears was that the whole feed would be lost. You can hear why hearing a message from the, I just was able to jump in from Mary Jo. We just have to get these types of real stories, whether they're public or not out there. Um, So thank you for your patience and your willingness to um, facilitate um, and to especially share and show up. So Tim, did you go yet? Or are you ready? I'll ask Tim a couple of questions and then we'll open it up to a little bit of Q&A. So Tim, again, you've used a variety of different storytelling platforms over time. Immediately when your campus closed, you were jumping into videos to offer uh, messages and showing up around campuses from giving um, live tours of the rec center to the library because you were surprised actually students wanted to see those spaces. And so you were literally the tour guide to do so. You also wrote on your Facebook business page the last day of the semester, this longer form message about turn the page, which I'll link to um, afterwards um, in this. But the one thing that I want to talk about in light um, recently was uh, last night you went live. I think it was on your individual Facebook page, but may have been streamed elsewhere as well called Tuesday Night Live, which from what I could take away was three JMU students that were discussing race and the parts um, that they were processing publicly as students to call in other students to dialogue with them about identity. Can you tell us a little bit about this program and why it was so important for the vice president of student affairs to be the facilitator and the producer of that um, conversation and um, but also how you were able to step out of that centeredness of yourself so then the students could just show up and be the center. Sure, um, I appreciate it. So when the when COVID-19 start, started and we went home essentially and sent our students home, uh, we were trying to figure out ways to stay connected with them and some of my staff immediately did a couple chats, really quick chats with our students and thought, hey, this has actually been pretty important for our students just to have a place to share. And then I proposed, hey, how about we just do a show every Tuesday? You know, I have this thing I've done before called Tim Topics where I just, something's on my mind. And and then one of them said, oh my gosh. And they're very alliterative. They're like, Tuesday Topics with Tim. That's our show. We got it. So then every Tuesday during the rest of the semester, we did this show where um, we just, Whatever was on our mind, we talked about it. We had, you know, guests. We had a student host. We had guests that came in, and we just talked about the, the news of the day or whatever else was going on. And then, when the, the in general, I was uncomfortable with my name being in the title because uh, in general, I would prefer to just be behind the scenes if possible. It's just hilarious to be a vice president when you feel that way. But uh, when the semester was ending, we thought, let's. This has actually worked really well for some students. They've liked it, so we created Tuesday Night Live. We're just waiting to get sued by Saturday Night Live once we get popular enough, I guess. And it's an hour-long show. Uh, we have one staff member who does a um, Sabias K section about did you know, and then we have trivia. Uh, we do a number of different things. We have a musical guest, and so this week we had had uh, our former student body president, Aliyah McLean and another student, Dion Gray, we're gonna be, Dion was the host and Leo is gonna be the guest. And then over the course of the weekend, there was just like, we can't do a show with Tim doing Name That Tune on his guitar, like I've done a couple times and some of these other, honestly, kind of sillier things that we do for fun. And when uh, our grad student, Sierra Ballinger, who runs the, really runs it, um, she reached out and said, I reached out to the students and they wanna run it and let's have a conversation. And they just want to talk. And we said, absolutely, we'll get, we gave this up. So I even tried to get even off screen. And my staff was like, well, it's kind of your show, so you got to be on screen. But we wanted to give the students that space and give them the time. So it's usually from 8 to 9 p.m. And we went to uh, went from 8 to 10.30 last night. Uh, we had breakout rooms, so smaller groups that maybe people that were uncomfortable talking in front of about 30 people could talk in a smaller group. And it was awesome, and now we've decided we're going to change the format for the rest of the summer. So next summer is going to, or next week on Tuesday, will be another session. We're going to add another student leader in who's asked to be a part of it. And honestly, I think I we were on for two and a half hours, and I spoke for a minute and a half total the entire time because it wasn't wasn't my place to talk. I honestly I spoke to say, hey, we're coming back next week. We're doing this again, and I basically said that in a long too long of a way of saying it, but. That's all I said, and then I got out of the way. And 
it really meant a lot to our students. And I think there's still a lot of work to do. Um, I'm not saying we solved anything, but I think we gave students that time and that space and, um, and we'll keep doing it week to week and, until the students are saying, hey, can we go back to the other stuff? Uh, and they'll decide that, um, but it's worked. And it was, it was another one of those things like uh, Mary Jo had said, we didn't plan that. I mean, we didn't plan to have that, but the students needed it. We had the platform already ready to go. And then we also live streamed it on Facebook Live last night as well. So it got more people to catch it than one normally would have when it was just a Zoom call. Uh, but it worked really well and I'm glad it, uh, we gave the space for students. Goodness, it's much different to unmute yourself when you're doing it from your iPhone. Thank you for that background. Um, and you almost had a slip of the tongue, I think something related to what we're gonna do next year. Like, what if we continue to do things like this though? Like, is this transforming not only what leadership looks like, but how we do um, provide student engagement and dialogue um, and, and maybe how we always should have been potentially showing up in a really quick and nimble way. Like this is pressing skill sets that we needed to explore um, for quite some time. So I encourage everyone to make sure they're following all of these leaders in, in spaces that they have shared. So you can, like, again, I just happened to catch Tim live last night on Facebook and, uh, and was even able to learn and experience from those students. So it's, it's so valuable beyond, even beyond our institutions. So I will open it up right now to some questions. Um, there is one, I believe, in the chat, we should be able to get to a couple of them. Oh, maybe it was answered. There was one that came through on the uh, question and answer, uh, Josie. So I, I typed in there, but but uh, um, it may still be open there. And Mary Jo, were you jumping in? Yeah, I just wanted to add something to um, to Tim's construct around thinking about regardless of what happens in the fall. So I we just started an esports team about a year ago. It was something right before I went out that we were working through. I watched all of their stream the Roller, I can't remember the dang game, uh, but it's they have a Twitch stream and they've actually have our Coog brand going through on the Twitch stream. So I've actually learned a whole new way of thinking with students and students know I'm watching. They're actually DMing me on Twitter. They were having conversations about it. So I am learning a whole new way of language that I didn't know. And I think that's the other piece of this is that regardless of how long COVID goes, and it will be probably 24 months that we're going to be impacted in a significant way. That's the minimum, right? The We also have to think about this generation that now lost their high school graduations, that lost all of their senior banquets, that lost state championships for band or for athletics. And so we really need to think about what does that mean to help them kind of grieve through that process, even as they come into our spaces in the fall and what that will look like for their sophomore, junior, senior, fifth year, right? Their super senior year. Um, and so I want us to, I, I guess I'd like us all to really think about giving ourselves permission to explore that space in a much more intentional, thoughtful and strategic way because our students are already telling us that this grief is driving a lot of the connection that they're going to be needing in the fall. And it, it won't, fall's not going to look normal. I, that's just, there's no reality I've seen that that's going to be normal. So how do we help, how do we help them live through this pandemic and live this life and take what they've learned from this experience and move it into a different place? I just thought that was really important to think about it from following up on Tim's comments about doing things differently. Mm, yeah, through the lens of grief. Um, and then a homework assignment, if you don't know what Twitch is, um, go give it a Google. Um, your students are on that platform. Um, so understanding how you could incorporate that, um, not necessarily that you need to start on it, but to at least know and how that could be incorporated into your student engagement strategies. Great. Okay. So I, I do think we have potentially a new question. So Kristen uh, asks about performing, the concept of performing. Uh, and have we challenged colleagues, especially of majority identities who might be performing or putting opinions or stories into online or even in-person spaces or taking action to get the credit? Um, I'll, I'll just quickly, I'll admit, I don't know that I've seen as much of that in my space, uh, not my space, but you know, in my world, no one's, you know, no one's using my space. I haven't seen a lot of it, but I do wonder sometimes when I see people who haven't ever said anything, I think, as was said earlier, and then suddenly are out in that space um, saying things. And uh, I see it more, honestly, not with colleagues, but more people that I'm connected to on Facebook or other places that I'm saying, 
you've never said anything like this. Um, and now you are. The interesting thing we're finding now, and we've had in the last 24 hours, we've gotten a lot of people sending us complaints about incoming first year students and what they've done online and asking us to rescind admission. Uh, and, and so we've seen that kind of stuff, which has been interesting. So more, we're seeing that kind of a challenge out there, not with colleagues, but with our incoming class. Cause I think there are a lot of people paying attention to that in a different way now than they maybe had in the past. But I, I do think that, you know, even me, as I think about what I'm posting is, am I posting this because people are going to say I'm great for posting it or am I posting this because it's what I believe. And I, I like to believe I fall back on the second that I'm posting this because this is what I believe. I'll jump in there if I can, Josie, and say, and thank you, Tim. I think you hit, you, you really hit a nail on the head there that um, people shouldn't be shocked by our interactions online in comparison to how we would interact with them face to face, right? So all of a sudden, yeah. if folks are jumping on this bandwagon and posting things, you're like, oh my God, you know, I, I, I didn't know that, you know, that's a problem. Because there should be some genuineness, there should be some consistency and behavior that now should not be the time that individuals are discovering our views on justice, injustice, race, and diversity. Um, I think folks need to take another look in the mirror. So thank you, thank you for for uh, mentioning that, Tim. And I just wanted to add really quick, I haven't seen this either, but I've been intentional about calling out racism within the Latinx community because a lot of times. It's like, oh, you know, we, we experience a lot, certainly, um, and there's a lot of work to be done, but we also do a lot of damage um, in our community, and even, you know, there's not enough acknowledgement of Afro-Latinos um, and, and all the history of colonialism and how we have erased them, you know, in history and in our home countries, you know, they're them and indigenous people, you know, we don't, they're not people that are cared for. And so that's, I think, where I have taken the opportunity instead of, because I haven't seen people trying to all of a sudden become a social justice person. I'm more like, hey, yeah, let's look internally. And so there was, I don't know if y'all have seen, there's a little post and it's three different colors of Latinx babies. And the one that gets the most compliments is the lighter complected. Um, and so um, that I think that's where I've been more active is in calling it out within my community, how we don't show up. Um, but I haven't seen it yet. So I'll be looking for the fakes. Or maybe they're just trying and, you know, what, what are they doing? Maybe just tell me about this. What's going on? Well, and Myra, you said something that I think is important to distinguish Um fake and performative are two fundamentally different things, right? If you believe, if you're putting it out there, right, to me, and I, we have to talk about this in construct of how we handle and how we approach white supremacy, right? Do we believe it's fundamentally true? If it is fundamentally true, then we have to talk about the complicity. And there is a process that I think it's important for people to go through to talk about how, oh, I have to own privilege. I have to own the power that comes with this seat, even though I am the first uh, Latina in this chair, right? I have to do all of that work as a part of it. Then there is the piece, and I think I don't think that's fake. I think that's fair to for people to talk about in terms of the narrative and their coming of age story, I think is important because it actually models how to do that for other people. The, the fake part for me, and I really have a hard time judging it, it is when, and, and you don't have to understand our students struggle with this, is it truly authentic? Is it is it real? Are you actually doing what you say you do? And if if we're if putting up a black screen yesterday made you feel better, but we there's no action attached to it, that's where we have to challenge that. And so for me, I think fundamentally the struggle is, and I, I don't want to judge because that's the part where I have I, performance is my issue, right? I have to think about that. I think all of us need to think about when you were putting, when we're being the digital storyteller, is it performance? Is it authentic? And are we doing the real work behind it? And I think for me, that's the, the place where I think we have to really contemplate who we are and what we are. And so I can't separate out the racism that's happened at WSU. I can't, I have to acknowledge it. I have to be a part of it. But the only way that I'm going to build a brand new WSU is if we talk about that history and we engage it and we say, yeah, you know, we benefited from a lot of native land. That's what I, we sit on land grant. We sit on the Palooza as purse lands. It's not just the land acknowledgement. It's what does that mean? Because when I say it, 
and I'm not living it and I'm not engaging it, that's when it becomes performative. So that's how I would, that's how I would distinguish between the two for me. I don't, I'm not saying it's, that's just the critical race theorist coming out in me. And Mary Jo, if I can just, one of the interesting things for me is I often tell our students, no one's living their real life on Instagram or Twitter that, you know, no one actually looks that good when they wake up and come get out of bed and all that. But I think that we, as, as you said, those digital storytellers have to be authentic in that space. And we can't, you know, you can't, I woke up this way. Like it's gotta be who you are and really, or don't say it. I would almost rather not say it than say something that's not accurate and who I actually am. I'll jump in there and say that we also have the power. We never know um, the influencers in our students' life or our community's life. And so, you know, Josie and I had this conversation weeks and weeks and weeks ago about the importance. I, I, put, I love to put up my family images. I love to put up certain images of po positivity because it's, I'm not doing it for a performance. I'm doing it. It's authentically me. But I also keep in mind the intentionality behind I was raised by a single mother, father wasn't present, men weren't really present. And so now as I'm seeking to be a father to my children, a present husband to my wife, that folks can learn from my personal journey and begin to reflect and learn and grow in their own personal journeys. And as situations come about, whether it be the George Floyds of the world or whether it be the COVID-19 or whether it be these other crises and points of retrospect and interaction and, and, and historical context and talks of future that as we interact and react to these situations, people can grow and learn. And so again, we're always are in a position to educate others. I do want to be conscious of the time of the multiple responsibilities um, that each of the panelists bring in multiple roles. Um, I feel so, um, I am learning. I am taking notes um, and appreciate how each of um, you have shown up today in the realness and authenticity um, and even notes that I hadn't even um, included in that I think are the, some of the biggest takeaways about us unpacking a bit of the performance in the need to address and speak out. But this step is big um, elements of self-reflection that I think, as Mary Jo pointed out, our students need more intentional dialogue, um, taking some of these questions and considerations back to your teams, back to your families. I hope this conversation could be much more broad than just in your um, role. And just to know how um, even a something that seems so simple of social media can be quite complex and opens us up to big bigger and even more important conversations than a Facebook post, right? But it is a means to get us to um, something much more deeper. So if all of y'all would be willing to join me in the chat, thanking our panelists with all the emojis and cheers that you can um, muster up on your keyboard. I sure do appreciate everyone's flexibility with my technical difficulties and the growth and learning that I um, have. Again, so important that this conversation happened and I will thank my lucky stars that um, the Zoom um, internet fairies kept things going, at least for the panelists. And I encourage all of you to reach out to all the panelists, follow them, learn with them and grow with all of us through this process. Again, you can find me at JosieAquist.com. If you've got ideas for future um, um, leading online panels or anything else that I can serve as a facilitator for, um, I am here for that. So again, thank you panelists. Um, thank you everyone that's joined us today and be well. Thank you so much for checking out this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to give us a little review or a share on those podcast platforms. Subscribing always helps too to make sure that you get every latest episode. You can join the conversation online, tweeting at me at Josie Alquist or the podcast Josie AT Podcast. Remember those show notes and additional resources can be found at JosieAlquist.com backslash the podcast. If you are interested in learning more about my speaking and consulting work on digital engagement and leadership or about my forthcoming book, check me out at JosieAquist.com. Thank you again to our podcast sponsor, Campus Sonar. Learn more about them at CampusSonar.com. Sending digital hugs, loves, and waves to whatever corner of the world you're listening in from. This has been Josie and the podcast.